Welcome to the Jaco Report. I'm Charles Jaco. To the St. Louis City Police Union, Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner is public enemy number one. To her political opponent, she's incompetent and probably guilty of suborning perjury. To her supporters, she's being targeted by smears because she's a black reform female prosecutor trying to fix the broken bail system and hold corrupt police officers accountable. Since Gardner was last on this program a few months ago, a lot has happened. The Jayco Report and the North Sider and South Sider newspapers first revealed the names and content of racist and violent Facebook posts made by current and former St. Louis police officers. Gardner has added the names of 22 of those officers to those already on a so-called exclusion list. That list prevents cops accused of misconduct from filing cases with her office. Then there's the matter of a grand jury and special prosecutor looking into allegations of misconduct by Gardner and her office. And it all started with disgraced former governor Eric Greitens. Back in February 2018, Gardner's office charged the then governor with felony invasion of privacy over photos he allegedly took of his mistress and bondage restraints in the basement of Greitens St. Louis home. Greitens hired a high-priced defense team. Among his lawyers, this man, Ed Dowd, former United States attorney in St. Louis, longtime Democratic Party heavyweight, and part of the Dowd family whose roots in St. Louis politics and law run back generations. Circuit Attorney Gardner, meanwhile, hired this man, William Tisby, a former FBI agent, to help investigate the Greitens case. But then came accusations Tisby committed perjury several times during his deposition and that maybe Gardner knew about it. Gardner dropped the case against Greitens in exchange for her office dropping a separate computer tampering charge and because the legislature was going to make him reveal his secret campaign donors, Greitens resigned. A special prosecutor was then appointed to look into the Tisby Gardner charges. Tisby was indicted for perjury. This last week, the grand jury adjourned with no charges whatsoever being brought against Gardner. And about that special prosecutor, the special prosecutor is this man, Gerard Carmody, a powerhouse St. Louis lawyer, best known for representing heavyweight corporate clients like Anheuser-Busch and the St. Louis Archdiocese. Well, it turns out that since their high school days at Chaminade Catholic High School, Carmody has been best friends with Ed Dowd, remember him? Dowd's the well-connected former U.S. attorney in St. Louis who was the lead defense attorney for Eric Greitens, the disgraced former governor originally prosecuted by Kim Gardner. And it's that seemingly cozy relationship that's led a lot of people to question the special prosecutor and the grand jury that just adjourned without indicting our guest, St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner. Thank you very much for coming back and being with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I know you're limited about what you can say on the uh, Tisby case, but uh, taken as a whole, the Tisby indictment makes it pretty clear by implication that they suspected you coached the guy. Yet, the grand jury was having none of it. They adjourned. No indictments uh, against you. No indication of wrongdoing by you. As a prosecutor, you know, if you put yourself in the shoes of a special prosecutor, what would one be trying to do if you issue an indictment like that, yet you fail to get a follow-up? indictment. What's going on? What's the legal dynamic that's going on here? Well, thank you for asking me that. Um, one of the issues is when you have an indictment, the prosecutor, we have special ethical rules and we must follow the law. And we are, it's very clear with Supreme Court, when we issue indictments, we have certain guidelines that the Missouri Supreme Court tells you this is how an indictment should look. So the first thing is the indictment should not be a 30-page um, manifesto of misinformation and allegations that I can't get into, but that's a, that's a problem. You have a form that you have to follow and you have to stick to the facts. And when, if you're implicating others in a indictment, they're usually not uncharged individuals. Right. I mean, I mean, that was going to be my question. I mean, that having read the indictment is just dripping with implication and innuendo that you might have known about it, and yet nothing came of it. I mean, does this lead you to suspect that there was, this indictment was, as they say in Texas, all hat and no cattle, that there was nothing to it and may have been politically motivated rather than legally motivated? Well, I can't speak to what you know, the internal thinking of a special prosecutor, but I do know in terms of how an indictment is supposed to 
be formed, and that is that causes concerns and ethical concerns as a prosecutor and understanding that we are guided by certain guidelines and rules, and regardless of individual in individual thoughts or opinions of, of personal nature, those are not put in, in an indictment because that is improper and it's not fair, and it's about due process for the accused as well as if an investigation is continuing. You have people have rights, and it's rights to a fair and unbiased process. A lot of your supporters have said that basically you're the victim of three strikes. You're reform-minded, you're black, and you're a female, and that was the reason that the so-called legal establishment here was, was coming after you. I mean, do you buy into that, or do you look at this much more narrowly as just a case of the legal process gone off the rails? Well, I look at it in terms of being in, in raised and born in the city of St. Louis all my life, and it's about cronyism and status quo. And when you change, when you are a reform-minded prosecutor, that you're about changing systems, you're going to have pushback, but pushback in ways that you would never expect. And I think that it's bigger than just Kim Gardner. It's about silencing the people of the city of St. Louis who elected me to make reforms that are needed in a system that has been broken, that has not worked, that needs to be changed. And when you look at a system that has failed all of us in terms of the violent crime that we hear, we see in our city of St. Louis, people are dying on our streets of the city of St. Louis. And we have the erosion of trust when we have this process where a prosecutor like no other has been treated in this manner, you have to wonder, what is it all for? Well, it's about holding on to the status quo of keeping the system the same. And I think that, you know, one can say it's politically motivated. You have to ask, you know, the, the people of the city of St. Louis. One can say it's about me individually, but it's about the people because I represent the people. I represent the change and what the people said they wanted the vision of this office to go forward to make our city safe. And I think that we have to look at being bigger than just these individual situations or political motiv mo motivations, but it's about doing the work, doing the hard work of how we change a system where you can be rich and guilty versus poor and innocent, and you're treated differently. With this out of the way, do you feel you've got a clear road now to do your job, or do you think there's something else waiting in the weeds for well, you? I, I'm not a, um, a you know, I, I wish I could tell the future because I would probably foretell lottery numbers so <laughs> I could be rich. <laughs> but, you know, what I do know is in spite of all of this, we've done our job. We we look at this one case, and we have over 10,000 cases my 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 office has reviewed annually. And we are doing the work during this incident, during the Greitens investigation, during the actual Greitens uh, indictment, as well as during this special investigation. And we're gonna continue to do the work that my men and women in my office, who without fanfare, without being thanked, or you know, even having you know, public accolades, they're doing their job. They're holding violent individuals accountable, but at the same time, we're reforming a system that needs to be reformed so we can make our city safer. Let's fast forward to the present day. Um, why, and this may seem like an awfully stupid question, um, why do you think the St. Louis Police Officers Association hates you so much? Well, I think that it's about, once again, when you're changing a system and you have many individuals who want to hold on to a system that has many complicated um, conversations that we have to, tough conversations that we have to have in terms of the criminal justice system. And some people feel that the system is biased against certain groups of people. But one of the things that affect all of the system, even the prosecutor's office, is the erosion of trust in law enforcement. And that's including my office as well as the police. And when you have a police union as one of the most aggressive police unions around this country, and we in the St. Louis region, we are the, the the ground zero for conversations of reform around this country. And we have this po this police union who has chosen to have this divisive rhetoric with racial undertones. We have to ask ourselves, how do we move our city forward? How do we continue to support those men and women who go out every day, who work hard out in the community to serve and protect? But we have a few individuals that continue to spot off divisiveness that 
erode and make all of us unsafe, even make police officers unsafe out on the streets, we have to start having a conversation that we can no longer tolerate this divisiveness and we have to work to, to making our city safer. In, in, in broad strokes, do you think that the lack of trust among big parts of the general public in the St. Louis Police Department because of those kind of attitudes, do you think that lack of trust is one of the big reasons that violent crime is such a problem in, in St. Louis? I mean, you, you've obviously got obviously have individuals who make a decision to yes. commit violent crimes. But if you've got a police organization that a large percentage of the civilian population doesn't trust, it seems to me they would be tempted to either take their law into their own hands to seek revenge and not call the cops, or just not call the cops at all and not provide any information. How much of an impediment is that to cutting violent crime if you've got distrust of the police like that? I think that we have communities that feel that they want police in their areas, in spite of what many may say that this area is where crime is, is plaguing you know, the community, is paralyzing the community. I think that is people who want to have a relationship with police officers, that they do, but they want police officers to respect them like they respect any other person that comes into their communities and give their children, give their family members uh, the same respect that they want for their family. And I think that we have to start having a real conversation of how we cannot over police areas with this aggressive mentality. And I'm not saying that that's what is happening, but that has happened. We have examples of that, but it's to build trust. You have to build respect and you have to understand the community in which you police. And we have to start saying, if you have individuals who represent groups of the police, individual police, you know, department, I don't feel like that's the sentiment of everyone in the police department, but when you have this organization who their goal is to represent those individual officers and no one says this is going too far, you know, just this week when they decide to put the, the Blue Line Punisher on their Facebook and call for members to do that, that sends a message that it's continuing to have this, 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 this disrespect and disregard for communities that are hurting, that are afraid, that need the police the most. And we have to build trust and we have to start with our actions. Our actions mean something and how we treat people mean something. And just like how we display our, our, our um, support for the police, police need to understand you also are a part of the community and you should also respect the community. Now that stylized Punisher cartoon character Skull was one of the many images that were featured in these Facebook posts by current and former city cops. Confederate flags, memes of them saying, I'm gonna serve and protect the bleep out of you, uh, images cheering protesters being beaten up. Um, just as someone who was born in this town, was raised here, who knows this town, when you first became aware of those and saw those images, what went through your head? Well, I think it's bigger than just the image. It's about the, the um, and I can't get in specifics because that is I'm under you know a actual open litigation, but we heard about the Plainview project. We heard about the issues with the Plainview project. Anyone in the in the community can go on that website and see. And we have to, as prosecutors, like we do every day, we have to 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 look at the credibility of individuals, and that includes police officers, and that's what we do every day. I mean, but did you just, was there a part of you just roll your eyes and, and thought, oh my God, here we go again, or did this really anger you as the chief prosecutor for the city that, wait a minute, I've got to deal with cases that people who have, you know, who are obviously racists who posted this stuff are bringing to me, thanks for making my job easier, guys. It continues to fuel the mistrust in the in the criminal justice system with law enforcement, and it makes our jobs harder. So it it hurts that victim who wants to call the police, but is afraid already of the process of the criminal justice system. It makes it when you see an incident, you fail to want to call the police and be a witness because you're afraid of who you may come in contact with, whether law enforcement or in the community. So this mistrust of law enforcement erodes the ability for the community to actually thrive and, and want to be a part of the solution of how we address those crime drivers in our community who prey on our community and keep people basically paralyzed and afraid to call law enforcement when, they're, when it's needed. But we have to have these conversations of how this divisiveness Whatever it is, is, it does not help how we're going to address violent crime. And we have to hold the police union accountable for 
this divisiveness and continue to say, what is the purpose of this? We, we have to be, if you're about serving and protect, you take an oath to serve and protect, we have to do no harm. And that is your job. And you, have, you're, you should be held to a higher standard, not simply, you know, your actions, your behavior means something and how you treat people means something. When your duty, you took a sworn oath to serve and protect. And we must serve and protect and we have to treat people with respect. But at the same time, we know police officers have a hard job. We know there's a lot of things that are going on. But at the same time, we must protect those men and women that risk their lives every day. And this, this mistrust and this fueling, this divisive rhetoric can cause problems even for those police officers who go out and risk their lives every day. Now, the 22 of the cops who, the current cops who posted this stuff ended up on the so-called exclusion list known in other jurisdictions as a Brady list where police have been suspected or accused of misconduct and they can't bring cases to the prosecutor. In Phoenix, their Brady list is public record. Mm -hmm. So you can check names against it to see if there's been past bad behavior. Here in St. Louis, the Brady list, the so-called exclusion list is closed. Why is that? Why, why are the names on that secret? Well, right now we're under litigation. That's the, the sole purpose of the litigation. So just because of the litigation, the names are sealed? That's one of the reasons, yes. Do you think it would be effective as a prosecutor if the names on the so-called exclusion list were publicly available, or do you think it's it's a best practice to keep them secret? I think it's it's a it's it's a it's both. It's what the jurisdiction in terms of how we assess credibility. I think that's an internal document that is not attempting to embarrass or harass or to intimidate anyone. And, and th we have to make sure that we have an internal process to eval evaluate that credibility. Um, that list in our office has never been intended to be for public consumption. It's for us to make our decisions on individual cases. And at this point, you know, in terms of the criminal process, we have ways of how, if that has to be disclosed in a court proceeding, we have a, a mechanism to do that. When it comes to overall violent crime, in St. Louis, I mean, or overall violent crime any place, there are generally two big schools of thought. One is that the, the alleged perpetrators are the product of their environment. There's a lot of poverty, high unemployment, broken families, etc. And then there's the other, which is that, yeah, but at the end of the day, every human being is responsible for, for the actions he or she chooses to take. Mm -hmm. um, from your point of view as a prosecutor, is there a balance to that? Because a lot of people have argued, no, the only way to, to do this is to ignore the background causes and just get medieval on people who commit crimes and put them away for long periods of time. On the other hand, there are people who say, well, the sentences should be absolutely minimal because of these exterior factors. Where do you fall on that balance? Well, I fall in a public safety harm reduction model. And what that entails is crime is on a continuum. You have certain violent crime that people are preying on individuals, causing severe harm. Those individuals should be reserved for a system that we understand and we know has the negative consequences and the effects of being put in the system or incarceration. So that's the extreme continuum. But we that's a small number that we deal with. There's, a, there's many individuals that are nonviolent, low-level offenders, and because of systemic issues, even in the violent offenses, there are systemic issues, but that's to the point where it's a public safety threat. But when you have harm reduction, when you have an individual who is lower on the continuum, that needs help, that that's not taking away that accountability of public safety, but that's addressing the root causes of what has driven them into the criminal justice system. And what we're dealing with is like the ER. You know, I'm a nurse, so I look at crime as a public health crisis. You know, we don't get to surgery right away. We have to actually look at what is causing the, you to need surgery and try to work on that before you get to surgery. And we have to, as a criminal justice system, we have seen the effects of mass incarceration, how that's not made our city safer, how actually prison causes more harm. And when you come out, you're not, you're actually more traumatized, you're more hurt, and you're more likely to re-offend. But if we reduce the numbers of individuals who are going into a system, and we know the negative outcomes, for it. And, and I'm not saying that that shouldn't be used, but that tool as a prosecutor should be used for the cases that's needed. But these are individuals on a lower end that if they had trauma-informed counsel, if they had cognitive behavior therapy, if they address the, the trauma that they're dealing with, we can make those individuals with 
an intensive program to address those root causes of that problem, we can make them whole, they become a better individual, they're less likely to go into the criminal justice system at all. And that person becomes a whole person that won't have that negative effect of the criminal justice system that what we're dealing with out here are not the individuals going away from prison for 30, 40 years. We're dealing with individuals who are on probation and we know the number one reason why a person goes to prison is a probation violation for a technical violation. So putting that person in and out of the system costs us more money, it costs us more time, and that person is forever marred with that conviction or that situation, they can never get out. And what we're doing, and we've seen, we've degraded populations where if they had gotten help, if they had gotten resources in the front end, we could have reduced the number of violent incidents later on in life because it's a direct correlation with pro being proactive of violent crime by getting to individuals early in schools like we are doing in the city of St. Louis under my leadership with our school diversion um, youth program, we're preventing young people from going into any system, whether that's juvenile or the adult system. We're actually, when people come into our system, if they're a low risk, we help them get jobs, we help them get the, the health care responses that are appropriate to address that mental health crisis, that addiction crisis, which we know uh, treatment for as a mental health crisis is better treated in the public health space than into incarceration because they're not getting the mental health treatment in prison. They're not getting that in the jail. So we have to look at whether we're going to continue to spend $30,000 a year to incarcerate someone, and it's a constant incarceration, or do we focus this money up front where we can give them the help they need to address the root causes and give them hope and get them past the situation and they become productive citizens? I think we should do that because, you know, we want to use our resources for those violent individuals. Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner, thank you very much for coming thank in. You. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Our thanks to Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner and our thanks to you for joining us. We hope to see you back here next week for another edition of The Jacob Report. See you then.